In this series of lessons, we will look at some exciting new research in the attempts to find the n-gram, which is otherwise known as a memory trace. We'll define the n-gram as the physical biochemical brain changes that explain the persistence of memory. Now we can think about memory or analyze memory at different levels of, of perspective. So for example, brains are composed of brain regions that may be talking to each other, so interconnected. So a given memory may have a distributed representation, a distributed engram. In other words, the memory may exist in part in multiple brain regions. Within a brain region, we have populations of neurons. A particular memory may only involve a subset of those neurons. And for each neuron that has uh, thousands of synapses, it may only be a subset of synapses that are involved in a given memory. Synapses we know can change their strength, so synaptic plasticity will be part of the story for uh, the engram. And we know that the LTP, for example, the late stages of LTP seem to require protein synthesis and gene expression, so we think genes will be involved in giving brains the capacity to change, to learn, and make memories. So we can think of uh, memories at the system level, so we have multiple brain regions that might be involved in a memory or an engram. We can think of uh, an engram as involving an allocation of some neurons to a given memory, some synapses to a given memory. We're going to call that allocation. Uh, we know that plasticity is uh, a key factor in how brains learn and make memories. So we have synaptic plasticity, and that plasticity is uh, mediated by protein products, which of course are the result of uh, gene expression. In this first lesson of the series, we'll take a look at the time course of an engram, from its formation to its persistence. First, some definitions. Memory is the capacity of an organism to acquire, store, and recover information based on experience. Now we're going to use a diagram like this to help us uh, follow the, the history of an engram. The engram state will distinguish two states, an active state and the dormant state. And then we have time here. So here we go. A memory for an event begins when the population of neurons is activated during the encoding of the event. A subset of those neurons are allocated to become the engram for the event. The persistence of an engram is due to strengthened connections between engram cells. So here we see up here the green and the red cells are active as they process some experience. But the allocation phase involves only a subset of activated cells actually taking part in the engram. So it's the red cells, let's say, that will become the engram, the memory for the event. Even though they were not the only cells that were active during the processing of the event, they're the ones that are allocated to become the memory for the event, the engram. And what we'll see is then uh, these cells, they're going to be strengthening their connections so that we'll have synaptic plasticity that will then link these cells into an ensemble, a population that represents the memory for the event. So consolidation, from this perspective, is a process that further strengthens the connections between neurons active during the event. This increases the likelihood that the same neural ensemble can be reactivated at a later time, which constitutes memory retrieval. Now we're putting consolidation here as sort of intermediate between an active uh, state and a dormant engram state. But this consolidation process seems to involve the strengthening of neural connections among those cells that are involved in the engram. In previous lessons, we've learned about hippocampal replay. This is hypothesized to be one of the mechanisms for consolidation. Memory processing can occur without conscious awareness. As with the compressed time frame for replay, we saw that the hippocampal replay is often very compressed in time and it may not reach our conscious awareness. It might be happening right after we learn something, but we're not aware that that kind of processing is happening. And it also includes the processing that happens during sleep. Of course, we're not conscious in slow wave sleep. We're not conscious, so we are not aware of whatever processing is going on there. So. Consolidation processes can happen outside of our awareness, whether uh, it's because of the compressed time of the signaling or it's happening during an unconscious stage of sleep. 
but the result of the consolidation would be the strengthening of connections between n-gram cells. During consolidation and afterwards, the n-gram can be in a dormant state that is not currently participating in loops of neural activity with working memory systems. So here we see then the n-gram, and here it's the kind of the yellow cells with, with strong blue connections would be the uh, n-gram for the event. Now, this would be in the dormant state. So these cells have undergone this strengthening, but they're not currently active right now. That was in contrast to the processing of the initial event, where all of these cells, the green and, and the red, were active, but it's only going to be the red ones that will be allocated in the dormant state uh, none of these cells is activated, but the yellow ones have been strengthened, have strengthened their connections, and they are the ones that constitute the engram for the event. Now, during memory retrieval, the engram is reactivated, participating in loops of neural activity with the working memory systems. So while the cells in the dormant state, they're not currently participating in loops, and so we're not retrieving the memory. When we do retrieve the memory, those n-gram cells now are going to be reactivated and participate in the loops of activity that we said was the working memory system. So now the n-gram cells will be activated along with uh, lots of other cells as well. But this would be the active memory retrieval. We're reactivating those very cells that were the n-gram of the event and those cells that were the n-gram of the event were a subset of cells that were active in the original uh, experience. After we reactivate a memory or we retrieve the memory, the memory will be reconsolidated and it'll return to a dormant state. Further retrievals end with new rounds of reconsolidation so that frequently retrieved memories become stronger and more quickly accessed memories. So you see, every time we retrieve a memory, that we reactivate it, the brain can undergo another round of consolidation where the links between the engram cells can get even stronger. And so we can imagine retrieving a memory and then storing it again. Retrieving, storing, retrieving, storing. If every time we store the memory again, we're in a sense making it stronger, then multiple acts of retrieval will end up strengthening the engram, strengthening the memory trace. Now, interestingly, when an engram is reactivated, the connections between engram neurons becomes temporarily destabilized. Neurons encoding new information that are simultaneously active can be incorporated into the original engram by the reconsolidation process. This is how memories can be modified and updated. Researchers also think false memories can occur by this kind of mechanism. So let, let's give an example. Let's say that the memory that was in a dormant state here, the engram was for some event at a party. Now, if I were to retrieve that memory, I'm going to reactivate those n-gram cells. That's what retrieval is. And here we see this picture up here. The red cells are the n-grams. One, two, three, four, five are the original n-gram cells. So this was the original memory that I'm retrieving. But now a friend comes along and tells me some new information about that very same event represented by activity in this cell here. The idea is, is that when we've got the memory engram cells active, along with new information, the new information can be integrated into the memory. Because the activity of this cell is simultaneously active with the, with the engram cells, and cells that are simultaneously active tend to be wired together, right? Cells that fire together, wire together. So the idea is new information now can be incorporated into this ensemble. When reconsolidation happens then, the connections between the new information and the old engram are strengthened. So now we've got a modified engram. The memory has changed. Now if the new information is accurate, that's one thing, but the new information might not be accurate, in which case the memory is going to be uh, distorted. It may, it, it's on the verge of becoming a false memory. But notice when I retrieve that party memory again, the new information will come along with it. So my memory has changed. It has been modified because every time we retrieve a memory, it becomes sort of vulnerable, destabilized, and it's capable then of being modified. Now this kind of makes sense when you think about semantic memory. So let's say the engram cells were uh, my memory for the concept of tigers. You know, what is a tiger? 
Well, uh, when I retrieve uh, my information about tiger, I can tell you what a tiger is and so on, but I can also learn things, new things about tigers. So if I've just reactivated my memory for tigers and then I learn something new about tigers, it makes sense to connect that information to the already existing uh, memory for tigers. And so, and so this kind of mechanism of retrieval leading to uh, destabilization leading to reconsolidation again that kind of mechanism is well suited to modifying and updating our knowledge base in the semantic memory system